Hey everybody, Dan John here from danjohnuniversity.com. Got an interesting question, and the question is simply this. Why do back squats suck? Well, how many answers do you want? Well, okay, as always, as you know, as, as the big kid in the room, it's my job to say, okay, hold on, let's ease up. <clears throat> One of my big beliefs as a coach is that uh, there is no room for moral theology in the weight room. Um, Obviously, you can do some things that are inappropriate and wrong, but I don't think any exercise is good or evil or, you know, even training programs are right or wrong. There's things you can learn from it. <laughs> it's something uh, Brian Oldfield used to say that, you know, uh, you can learn something from every everybody, you know, you know, and most people are just bad examples. Um, why do back squats suck? Okay, a couple of things. Um, I have put back squats on the back burner for myself and most of the athletes I train. Now, having said that, there is great value to back squatting. Uh, if you want to put on body mass, for most of the athletes I work with, uh, North Americans built a certain way, a certain kind of DNA, the back squat seems to help put on mass. Now, uh, there's that thing called GOMAD, you know, gallon of milk a day program, and, you know, uh, high rep squats. There's nothing new to this. You know, this is what John McCallum was preaching in the 1960s in Strength and Health magazine. Um, high rep back squats, we, you know, the, the old joke was you take a weight you can do for 10 and you do 20 with it. Uh, I know that stuff works. Uh, interesting uh, and to defend high rep back squats. The best discus throwing of my early career happened after I took on a bet to squat uh, 300 pounds. The bet was to squat 300 pounds 61 times. Now I didn't get it uh, in full candor, but I did squat 315 for 30, 275 for 30, 225 for 30 in one workout. And in one workout to prepare myself, I squatted 135, 60 kilos, 61 times for two sets. <clears throat> I don't know how helpful that was, but I tell you one thing, I don't care what the load is when you, <laughs> when you do over 120 reps of any exercise, it's, it's a lot of volume. My knock on high rep squats is that it became, a high, a, on, on back squats, is it became a religion. It became the answer to all things. I remember Kim Goss coming back from our national training camp and him saying that, yeah, he was with these people that no matter what the question was in Olympic lifting, that if they got their back squat up, they would, uh, they, no, you know, if they didn't finish their pull on the snatch, more back squats. If they didn't lock out a jerk, more back squats. If they didn't, more back squats. If they didn't, more back squats. <clears throat> There's some people online that still think that back, back squat is the answer to all uh, questions. Now, maybe it is for certain clients, but I'll tell you this, for athletes, we discovered we discovered that the back squat, you know, has its value, and then it doesn't. Uh, you can disagree with me on this, but um, in my experience, the overhead squat and the front squat was more indicative of how my uh, athletes perform than the back squat. You can get guys into the gym who can back squat for high reps, huge amounts, yet can't play on the field. Um, I was at a clinic years ago, and I, it was the Ohio State offensive line. And he was showing us this block where the right guard had to get off the line of scrimmage and then get in the way of the on inside linebacker. So the guy that was head on to him and get get in, get the inside linebacker inside. The play is flowing this way. The guard was supposed to jump up, run down this extraordinary athlete and drive him inside. And, and a friend of mine raised his hand and says, how do you get athletes, how, how do you get your athlete to do that? And the coach is kind of this big, big macho thing and said, well, if he can't do it, we find somebody who can. Well, uh, you know, typical high school coach, we've never had that high school, uh, high school athlete ever, and we're probably never going to get that athlete. So sometimes you can just, you can have a program and you can say, well, damn, this school or this team to squat, 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 squats, and look how good they are. And my point would be, yeah, they're also literally one in a million, one in 10 million genetic freaks that are doing that. And honestly, just about anything you do would work. Uh, that doesn't always go over well because people don't like to hear it. 
for home trainers, um, the back squat doesn't always work as well. It means you have to have full racks. Uh, I like the front squat for home trainers. I think it's safer. If something bad happens, you drop it. Maybe you get knocked ass over key, tea kettle behind you. But, you know, except for the floor and your ego, generally nothing bad happens. Um, I like to clean as a home trainer my front squats. Uh, that's most of my career. <clears throat> we would clean the weight and do front squats. We would clean the weight, jerk it overhead, slide the hands out, and do overhead squats. Um, I always thought that was much better. For high performance, I've always seen the parallels between overhead squats and front squats to be much more in correlation to performance than the back squat. In my own case, I've mentioned this many times. I was told uh, by trainers at a certain place that has five rings that I needed to up my back squat and get my uh, and, and go on to a high carbohydrate diet. I did both. And that's when I ended up squatting 605 for three. And I would have done more reps, except I had a mirror and I could see how <laughs> the look on my spotter's faces was pure fear. And so I, I walked it in. Here's the funny thing though. My performance as discus thrower went down when my back squat went up. So now this is a N equals one experiment, of just little Danny John, but this happened over and over and over again in my career. Listen, folks, the key is this, and I, and I believe this in, to my core, is that the movement of squatting should be done every single day. I use Tim Anderson's original strength, and of course the six point rock is squatting. Uh, when I was uh, getting over my total hip replacement, I did six point rocks and walking as the core of my rehab program, and both my doctors and my physical therapists were shocked how quickly I recovered because I was doing the movement of squatting every opportunity I could. I mean, I'd watch TV shows doing uh, rocking and walking is, you know, basically how you rebuild your spine and every other system in your body. When in doubt, walk. I believe the movement of squatting should be done daily. I believe that with all my heart and soul as a coach and as an athlete and as a human person. Adding load in the back squat, well, good for you. You're gonna show me all these tables with all these numbers. And frankly, I don't, I'm, I can no longer be convinced that the back squat is the answer to all questions as we used to be taught when I was a child. Does the back squat have value? Absolutely. I teach squatting in this order. We teach the goblet squat. After the goblet squat is mastered, we move to the goblet squat to overhead squat drill. I have that like four or five times in my YouTube videos. Just look it up. Then we do the overhead squats. After overhead squats, I teach the front squat. And then after the front squat, I teach the back squat. Now there's reasons I do that. Number one, if I teach you to back squat and you get your back squat up to 600 pounds, there's no way I'm gonna get you to overhead squat with a broomstick because your ego won't handle it and you, it'll feel stiff, it'll feel funny. Um, and you could argue, and I'm, and I'm okay with this, that I'm just not a good enough coach to make this happen, and, I, and I'm fine with that. I hate the low bar back squat it, in the same reasons I hate the uh, good morning. Uh, those are positions you never see actual athletes in. Now, someone's gonna raise their hand and they're, they're gonna show a picture of someone coming out of the stance in a in a football game, but as a, as a coach in American football, that's a hinge. You're coming out and you're hinging into your athletes. Um, the bench press and the squat, as most American high school coaches have discovered, very rarely do the bench press and squat carry over onto the field of play. You know, I played with guys who bench pressed a lot and uh, they, their performance in the field was terrible. But you know, it's weird when I had athletes do power snatch overhead squat combos, those athletes tended to be able to use what they learned in the weight room onto the field of play. You could just say maybe, Danny, you don't know the low back uh, squat well enough, you, you, the low bar back squat well enough and you can't teach it. Yeah, I mean, I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, it's a position I would never have an athlete get in. It's interesting though. Uh, you know, the late Brian Oldfield, when we talked about front squats, he'd always go, 
uh, you know, he'd go, ah, that's the position you want to be in. You know, you want to be tall like this. And then he would show the, he would take the front squat position and he'd put a shot in it. You know, he didn't, he'd go like this and show the shot put. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Uh, for discus throwers, it's the overhead squat. One of the things we're learning <clears throat> in the past few years in sports is diverse from rugby to track and field is getting those big back squat numbers up doesn't always seem to help as much as you think. 